Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the live. I know I'm going live a couple of minutes early, but I saw lots of people here, so I thought I may as well go live. So uh, welcome back. Uh, it feels like ages since I've been doing a live stream. Uh, it's probably only two or three weeks, but it's great to be back. A couple of housekeeping things before we get going. Just a reminder, if you are here live, uh, which is fantastic, uh, please... Uh, oops, sorry. I just, <laughs> I always forget to turn my volume down on my little thing, which I check. We're going live. We're going live. So um, if you are here live, remember, uh, leave a uh, type the word question, ideally in capital letters, so I can spot it there. So that's really good. Uh, if you're watching this afterwards, this is not a regular video. This is a replay of a live stream. And I will put a chapter so you can jump straight forward to the first question. So um, I want to do a couple of little housekeeping bits and pieces um, before we get going. So. I'm actually just looking at my stats today. I'm about, uh, let's have a look, I'm about 500 short of uh, hitting uh, 350,000 subscribers, which is quite amazing. Of course, subscribers are very important, views are more important, so that's quite exciting. Um, so what I've decided to do this, um, this year is uh, partly because people enjoyed having more visitors, uh, visitors, guests on board, is I'm going to do, uh, I've decided to get more guests on uh, the live stream, and particularly those smaller emerging channels, particularly channels that have 20,000 or fewer, in some cases, 10,000 or fewer, because certainly when I started, you know, getting more exposure was great. So I've invited a couple of people uh, for the next four or five live streams who often crop up here in the live stream. Um, so they often uh, come along anyway. Um, and I've tried to choose a couple of people who travel differently to me, either different lines or they travel as couples. So over the next coming couple of weeks, so next week we'll have Paul and Carol from Paul and Carol Love Travel. After that, we'll have Bob and Holly from Innocence Abroad. We can have Tom and Dom from Tom and Dom Travel and Gavin and Luke from Cruise Monkeys. So we'll see how that goes. Um, hopefully that goes well, you all enjoy it. But it'll be great to also get some different perspectives, particularly on lines that I have less experience with or people you know who love a certain line, which I don't like. So I thought could be quite interesting kind of way of doing things differently. Uh, just a reminder, uh, one other thing is, uh, I always mention this, is if you ever want to become a channel member or patron, uh, that would be great. Uh, for example, I live streamed my region trip to patrons and members. Uh, you get a whole bunch of other stuff like coming, you know, invite to the group cruise and all that. It, it's not for everybody, but if you're ever interested, you know, below the videos, you'll see the word join. So let's get going. I think that's all the housekeeping stuff. So let's get going. Um, <clears throat> and we've got a couple of questions coming through, but I might just start with uh, some people already saying, um, you know, guests are fun, so good Lou and uh, Claudia and so on. Uh, see that uh, they're, they're keen to, to see that. And we've got other people that I'm sure I'll be inviting on, Chad and Matthew Cruz, and so many people I'll come back and hopefully invite um, uh, on f future um, uh, live streams. But one other thing, by the way, if you are in London, we're gonna be in London this week um, on the 3rd of February, uh, which is Friday, um, I'm talking at a panel, I'm part of a panel at the Destination Show, which the Times and Sunday Times put on at 12 noon on Friday. So if you're interested in that, um, I will leave a link actually in this because you can get free tickets to come uh, to the show, two free tickets by putting in speaker guest to that. So anyway, so I will, uh, lots of more more uh, things than I'd probably, probably plan in housekeeping. So um, as I said, I'm back from Region 7 Seas. Uh, I've, got, I've already started working on some of the videos. One of them will hopefully be out pretty soon. Uh, as I mentioned, I did live blog to members and Patreons. Some of the early experiences I have here, you probably can't see it, but here's some of my notes about likes and dislikes and so on. So maybe I thought I'd give a quick summary of that um, and then we'll get dive into the questions so we just don't spend too much time uh, talking about things people don't want to talk about here. But certainly I had a great time in Region 7 Seas. As you know, it was my uh, 100th cruise. Uh, a couple of things that I thought they did incredibly well is, you know, many of the cruises since startup, uh, you know, people are complaining or observing that they seem understaffed, staff aren't well trained, and so on. The one thing I would say was the Regent crew were incredible. Uh, they felt really, they're really on the ball. They felt very well trained. They really felt that they were, you know, in their A game, if that's <laughs> if that's the right expression. I was really, really impressed with the crew. Uh, and it's interesting kind of ex comparing them to other ultra luxury lines because they were, it's, it, they're relatively informal in many ways. It's quite a chatty, friendly uh, situation. So the crew are clearly allowed to chit and chat and be a bit more friendly. There are some boundaries there. So, uh, you know, because uh, for example, I'd 
taking some pictures with my cabin crew and they were like, oh, you know, don't don't share those too much or whatever. So they're a little bit jittery about what is and isn't allowed, I guess. But the crew were absolutely phenomenal. If anything, I would say uh, the only downside is they're probably a little bit overly obsessed with making sure that everything's okay. I mean, at dinner, I would have five or six people, you know, from the maitre d', the head waiter, the waiter, the whatever, ask me if everything's okay around the ship. You know, it's almost people are, um, uh, you, you know, um, you know, almost asking too much, uh, if you like. So someone asked me if the video is playing for everyone. I'm assuming it's okay because uh, people are, no one else has commented that. Um, so food, outstanding, uh, incredible menus, incredible food, really, really incredible food. You know, up until now, I think the gold standard for me for food has been Cunard Queen's Grill. Uh, probably on reflection, I might say that it, Regent may surpass that, if not certainly match it. Um, absolutely incredible uh, food. The ship I was on, which was Navigator, is one of their older ships, a little bit brittly, rattly, vibratory. Um, so it's going to be interesting going on some of their, their newer ships. Uh, I really liked the huge choice of excursions you get included within the fare. So you're paying a big premium for that, but including the fare. I worked out, I probably got about $1,000 worth of uh, excursions and a great choice of excursions, but really love the fact that it's always, always small groups. So even when there was a big excursion like the, the beach day at Barbados, we went on in groups of 15 and 20 on buses that could hold 30 or 40. So stuff like that. Um, so some of the downsides, dislikes um, was, you know, there is no option for casual dining in the evening other than room service. So you always have to go do a full three course meal. So even the buffet turns into Seti Mari, you know, if I pronounce it correctly, um, uh, Italian restaurant. So there's no option for just a quick, easy dining kind of uh, option. Um, so, and the program is pretty light in terms of activities. Uh, so if you're looking to really be entertained, that's less of a, a positive. The overall entertainment, I mean, the entertainment team, big team, 12 uh, performers, um, you know, very talented. I thought the, the shows were, were not great. I thought they were very dated kind of shows. And I think it's a pity because the, the, the clearly a lot of talent in the performers, um, but the shows I thought were very dated. And although I think it was Beth and I had conversations, they had things like a Beatles deck party, which I groaned at because you know, I still see the Beatles as my parents' era. Uh, and I'm 63. And they had an ABBA evening, which is fairly predictable. But I thought the entertainment was a little bit dated, a little bit jaded. I thought there could be a real big improvement on entertainment. You know, Seaborn, for example, has started doing partnerships with like... Um, uh, Tim Rice to bring something a little bit different. I just felt there's so much talent in that team and it was a bit underdone. So anyway, that's a quick jog through. Obviously, in my videos, I will talk much more about it. And I'm going to do two videos at least. One about this crew specifically where some things didn't go that well at the beginning and things got better. Um, and then I'll do a much more deep dive into Regent, uh, pros, cons, and some of the comparisons. So let's get into the questions because I'm sure that's why many people are here. So AIT Direct just got back from the Toscana and the buffet was total chaos all the time. So bad is this normal? I think because they only open for certain hours, it seems to compact the problems. So Toscana, I'm not sure which ship that is, AIT Direct, to so just confirm if that is, uh, I'm not sure what ship that is. Tell me what ship that is. But um, I think <clears throat> it, the buffets, as ships are refilling up again, are chaos. Buffets have always been chaos and are pretty much chaos. Uh, you know, my experience, particularly going back to very full ships um, like the Conningstam, um, and even when I was on Disney in the summer, very full, it was always chaotic. Um, so that's it's more chaotic from the passenger side. So let, let us know which ship that is. I probably should know that. Um, up close with Lawrence booked their first cruise. Um, and so Eric, hi there. Excited for an upcoming 10-day Baltic cruise, which is a great itinerary, spotlighting five European capitals. Considering excursions, would hop on hop of hop on hop of buses be a good option in Helsinki and Stockholm? So I've done the hop on hop of buses in both of those, and they are pretty good. Um, the Stockholm one is very good. It goes, I seem to remember, it goes really quite a, a wide um, area and does certainly go past the, uh, the the cruise terminals, which is pretty good. Um, Helsinki, it, there was le the, it was less exciting the hop on hop bus, the, probably because there are fewer places to go. So it takes you to the park. Uh, is it Sabir, Sabilius? Sabilius? Um, and stuff. So Helsinki, I would probably look more doing some other kind of excursion. It's fine. But the hop on off of bus itinerary wasn't quite as exciting. Um, if you are going to Oslo, for example, the hop on off 
or Bus in Oslo is really, really good if you go to Copenhagen. Again, that takes you to all the great places. Um, Helsinki is probably the weakest of all of the ones that, that I've been on. Peter, hi there, Peter, good to see you again. Now, <laughs> now when you've done Super Luxury, how do you think it will be to go back to Holland America or Princess? Great question. And in fact, I, a couple of people asked me during this trip, and I probably should, I will put it on my list to do, is to do a sort of a comparison, Peter, between you know going uh, ultra luxury, where obviously you're paying a lot of money, but you may still have more of an entry level cabin, um, like I'm doing with Japan, which I think, I think I've got the second best cabin, but it's still way down the ranking of things, um, versus say buying a Neptune suite or something on, on or a, a suite on Princess, and just comparing a little bit of those and how it stacks up price-wise. So I, I think um, I'm quite excited. My next trip, Peter, is actually on Holland America. So I'm going on Oosterdam. Uh, uh, people could tell me off for pronouncing, uh, being pronouncing Norwegian, uh, sorry, Holland America ships incorrectly and not damn or damn. Anyway, Osterdam, um, uh, South America. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, partly, and the reason I'm looking forward to that is partly because it's driven by the itinerary. They go to great itineraries. They're very good destination immersion. And I do really like um, the, uh, the the music walk um, entertainment. I do find, you know, I like some of that entertainment. So I think it'll be great. Um, it'll be fun. It will be very different to your point. It's a very different experience. So I felt very um, pampered and looked after and fussed around. There I know it's going to be a little bit more anonymous because obviously it's a, it's a bigger ship. But I'm quite looking forward to going to that, get back to Honor America. I do have a soft spot for Honor America, but I will definitely tell you afterwards. I think you know, understanding it's a very different experience. I will have a much bigger cabin because I booked a bigger cabin there, so that will also be nice. Princess uh, will be interesting. I do need to go back on Princess. I haven't had great experiences on Princess, and I do need to go back on, on that. I think... I'm probably looking more forward to Honor America. But I think doing a comparison is going to be very interesting because what you get and don't get. So when I was looking at my likes and dislikes, you know, many of the dislike sites you get on those ships, you know, casual dining in the evening price, obviously, uh, bigger program, um, probably dealing better with solos in a way, um, although they did do some good solo stuff. But if you wanted um, there, um, uh, and, you know, a couple of bits and pieces like, bits and pieces like that. Um, Heather, uh, off on Royal Caribbean tomorrow, and we have two more Disney cruises coming this year. I'd love to join you sometime, Gary, if you're interested. Um, I th guess you mean on, on Disney or Royal Caribbean? Absolutely. And the one thing is, a couple of things on that, just building on Heather's point is, there's two, two things when it comes to that. Is one of which, as many of you probably know, um, I am starting to do, try and do some group cruises. I've got one which is confirmed in April 2024, which initially is just going to be kind of a member's patron cruise to keep it a little bit smaller get some learning and stuff like that um, but certainly if you want to become a member or patron you can still book that we sold out the original cabins so it's going to be a little bit bigger than i planned um, but then i'm working on which hopefully i'll be able to announce uh during the course of february um a, a, another group cruise in um september or october it's down to about three or four itineraries um i just need to zero in on those itineraries and um do the negotiations with the cruise line that's the one thing to do obviously uh, and the other is I do post all of my uh, cruises on my blog. Uh, so if you go to my blog, tipsfortravelers.com, and travelers are two hours, people can also see when when I'm when I'm uh, when I'm there. So if anyone's done a world cruise, I've only done half a world cruise. So uh, no, but if anyone has, be be great, great to know. Uh, actually, Jenna making the point. Actually, um, there is a lot of uh, princess deals on at the moment. I actually got one yesterday. Now, Princess is probably a little bit on the weaker side normally for solos, but they're doing a solo promotion at the moment, um, so that's quite good. Uh, is the suite of 6001 of Conningsdam a good suite? I don't know if anyone's been in 6001. Uh, shout. One of the things to do, by the way, up close to Florence, is I would literally Google, uh, no, go, go to YouTube and put in Conningsdam suite 6001. You'll be surprised how often that those cabins come up, uh, and also on Cruise Critic. They now, what they get, try and get people to do is to review individual uh, cabins. So, uh, so that's, that, that, that may help you as, as well. Um, Bill asking a question. So I'm going to have a slurp of my tea. Booking a cruise on Oceania, <clears throat> thanks to your comparisons. Very, I love that, as you know. They're offering a two for one booking and other perks. How can we tell if this or that on other lines is actually a savings or bait? Great question, Bill. And there's been actually quite a lot of discussion in some of the forums and, and um, in some articles I've been reading about this. So 
in the wave season like right now there is a lot of deals and a lot of competition and it's sort of coming towards an end but january is a massive big month so a lot of the deals around seem pretty authentic so you know region for example are doing a, a two for one deal and sort of comparing it does seem pretty good but that's under the at the same time where we're seeing definitely um fares are increasing and we've seen a couple of uh, of the earnings call from that uh, Norwegian. I've seen some interviews with Carnival talking about how they are seeing fares increasingly going up. So so at the moment, I think it's a combination of two things. One of which the deals in the wave season are normally pretty good and pretty tight. Um, the, a lot of them have launched new itineraries, so they're trying to get ships way out. You know, for example, I got a region brochure uh, in the post today. I mean, they're right out into 25 already with lots of kind of early booking deals. So generally speaking, it's it's it should be, um, it, it, they, they, at the moment, they seem kind of, okay there's lots of this but so i do think they're at the moment they're okay partly because they're in a very competitive uh world you know that i've seen come back to my princess but i'm seeing princess sort of upping some of their promotions um but you know i think you need to watch that very carefully i'm trying to think of the article that i read where there were some comparisons saying just you know watch out a little bit but prices are rising fares are rising definitely and that that, that links to the video that's coming out after this where i talk a little bit about more about fares uh, so Mark, um, I'm cruising with my large family and bringing our one-year-old baby. We're cruising on Norwegian cruise line in the Caribbean. Any recommendations? So Mark, one of the things I would check, double check is what, um, and I can't remember exactly on Norwegian, what the situation is for children of that age. So I know someone asked me recently, um, you know, they wanted to take a child who was under two years on a cruise and there weren't that, not all of the cruise lines had other, um, you know, uh, access to the kids club or sort of a babysitting facilities for kids under certain ages, like three years in some cases, um, some of them do. So I would first of all check that. So you can understand your flexibility. Are you gonna be able to put the, the, the little toddler, so when you're called toddler or baby, I guess little baby, um, uh, into some sort of a kids club or uh, some sort of babysitting, which gives you obviously more flexibility uh, in the evening, because that's really gonna be uh, important. So I would focus a little bit on that, because that's gonna be, uh, you know, your drive. The other thing I would say on Norwegian cruise line is, I'm not sure which ship you're on, but, um, you know, many of the ships still have, although we don't know if it's going to last, the big production shows in the theatre. So they have actually just an encore cancelled at very short notice, um, Kinky Boots. But all the ships at the moment seem to have them on, although Norwegian says they are going to be cutting back on the entertainment. One thing, uh, entertainment team. So one of the things I would do is make sure whether you check before you board or once you're on board is, Make sure that particularly if you're traveling with a large family, a large group of people, and you all want to go together to see those shows, that you book the shows as early as possible. And also linked to that, because ships are back sailing full again, is plan across your, your trip what excursions you want to do and what especially dining you want to do. And go in as early as you possibly can and book those as well, because those are becoming more and more challenging to book. You know, a lot of us got used to in 21 and 22 ships went full. You know, you could book excursions a little bit later, it didn't matter. Definitely, I'm seeing it really fills up. I mean, even with my region trip, with excursions are included. I mean, I literally went, went in as they opened, but realizing because people with higher grades could come in a little bit earlier. And, you know, I was waitlisted on the very first day for some excursions. My, I managed to be, get lifted off those, uh, which is good. So I would really go um, in. Um, Helen or Gary, uh, so then it's Helen or Gary here, uh, tipping on Norwegian Cruise Line. So Norwegian Cruise Line, they will give you a couple of options. Uh, it's auto added, so you can pay them before you go. So for example, my Norwegian Cruise that I've got um, later this year on their new Viva ship, I've prepaid the gratuities, so they're done out of the way, um, um, or they will charge them on board. Um, <clears throat> and they've just increased them by 10%. So the, the tipping has gone up and there's a slightly different tipping. You pay slightly more if you're in the Haven as you do if you're in a balcony inside Ocean View or Solo, uh, the Solo Suites. Um, and I can't remember the exact number, so I won't quote it, but it's around, around about $14.50 per person per day. Um, and that includes kids as well from what I r remember. So one of the things I think it's often good to do is, is prepay before you go so it's done. And then, you know, you, remember, you don't have to tip on top of that. Some people like to tip on top of that if they have a great cabin steward or the barman. Remember, mind, they add, if you haven't got a drinks package, they will add gratuity on the drinks. If you don't have a drinks package, you buy a drinks package, they will add the gratuity on that. If you go to the spa, they will add a gratuity on uh, around about 18%. But uh, I like to prepay them. If I have great, great service, particularly in the cabin steward, 
I will tend to tip a little bit extra. So even on Regent, where it's all included, uh, I had the most phenomenal um, cabin stewards. So I actually tipped them a little bit extra. They were almost like a little bit surprised, but they also did. They were both fans of the channel, which was all, well, they watched the channel. I think they were fans. And they're both very, they both subtly hinted that they wanted to be in the video. So I also felt that was a good thing to do. So that's, you know, get it out the way, it's it's there. And um, one of the things that's important, although I can't remember the cutoff date is, um, I think it's probably too late now. There was an opportunity to prepay gratuities at the old rate. So go and check that. I, I can't remember, uh, Helen or Gary, what the cutoff date for that was. I think it might be the end of this month. So that's that's that, that that's what we go. Here we are. Beth's been on a world cruise on Crystal Grand Voyages and booked on Mariner for 2024. Very exciting. Very, very envious. Uh, uh, Lawrence asking the question about Conning Stam. Hopefully we've answered that. Um, <clears throat> so, Andrew, um, in terms of the scuba diving, I suspect you're right. Uh, I haven't seen, I'm trying to think on the cruises coming back. I haven't seen a lot of scuba. One of the things you might want to do, Andrew, is also take a look at some of the other providers like Shore Trips, a group, and Venture Ashore, see if they offer, offer scuba. Um, but I suspect during COVID it was a little bit, but certainly back now with, uh, you know, all the snorkeling ones are back. Um, you know, I did quite a few snorkeling excursions uh, on my most recent one. Uh, they didn't have any scuba ones that I remember uh, there, but um, definitely, definitely it's kind of uh, uh, coming back. But look at those alternatives could could be one of the things to do. Um, SK100CA, would love to go on a cruise, but is COVID still a concern on board? Certainly, I mean, I guess it's there. We're not seeing it as much. I mean, <clears throat> I you know, certainly compared to be, you know, sort of even in, in the Omicron days and so on. Uh, I, you know, when we were on, um, when we were on um, wet, uh, Conning's Dam, I know some people clearly had it COVID because it's hurts people being isolated. I've had some other people I've seen being isolated, but it's much, much more isolated um, now. Uh, you know, and certainly it's not, we're not seeing what we saw way at the beginning. And even in, in Omicron days, you know, cruise ships have got rid of their um, their isolation cabins. You know, there's some people recently, they both of them got it and they just stayed in their, they were isolated in their cabin. Um, uh, the one thing that I would stress, by the way, because um, uh, some people who follow the channel discovered this on Queen Victoria, um, one of the things that's important is uh, re up until a certain point of time, the cruise lines would refund you. They'd give you future cruise credit if you did get COVID on board and were isolated in your cabin or were asked to isolate in your cabin. Now they don't do that and they um, you have to it has to be covered by your insurance. So And they'll just give you a certificate or some sort of letter saying that you were. So, for example, with my Region 7 Sea cruise in the gump that came, it was very clear if I got COVID on that for whatever reason and had to isolate, the only time they would give me future cruise credit is if I could show uh, I had, had an independently verified negative COVID test before boarding. They didn't check it, but that was part of the process. So that's really important. Michelle, this is a really interesting question. A lot of people asked me that on the trip, and I will digest it and think a bit, a bit more. So uh, in terms of Regent and Oceania, of course, they're both the same company. They're both owned by Norwegian Group. Um, they both have small ship uh setups although obviously the bigger oceania ships are bigger than the the even the biggest regent ships are even bigger than the grandia they both have really good food um you know regent i would say you know is even better than oceania in terms of food they have much bigger menus so, and you're also going to have things like caviar uh you know breakfast or that you know stuff like that they have a couple of caviar breakfast souffle every night for dinner um uh you know they do have depending on the ship you're on you're on you know special dining is uh, is included, so there's no extra extra fees there. But one of the key differences, I would say, you know, service is even at another level. Service on Oceania is great, but it's even at another level there, uh, even more attentive. Uh, you know, it's a little bit more plush. So you know, even just you know the the small things like you know the um, the, the, the sheets are even plusher than they are on Oceania. The the toiletries are loxatan. I can't remember what they're on Oceania. So everything's a little bit more plusher. Obviously, the big Difference is you have a much more inclusion. So all your alcohol is included in the fare, which is not in Oceania. All your, you know, your excursions are included. Um, you can go for some premium ones, but there's all the excursions included. Um, gratuities are included. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of just a little bit plusher, even more attention to detail, even more ramped up in terms of uh, of food are probably the, the key differences. And one of the things I've been asked, and I will do this um, and see whether it's better to do in a video or a blog is, 
is take a look at, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you were here, is take a like if you traveled in Hollow America or Celebrity in the kind of a suite kind of, you know, the upper end or the haven, Oceania on a smaller ship experience, and then something like a Regent, Seabon, and what, what, how does it all stack up cost wise uh, and comparison wise? It, I did feel, I mean, I feel fantastic on Oceania and I always feel very incredibly well looked after, but on Regent, it just goes that little bit different. It's a bit, I guess, between staying at a really plush five star hotel to a very good four something star hotel, I guess. Um, Heather asking me the question if, have I ever gotten bored on a cruise? Do you use it as an excuse to relax or do you end up feeling restless? Does it affect your choice of cruise line? So it's interesting. I, I don't ever get bored on a cruise, but that's also because most of the cruises are gone. I, if I, I'm working as well as trying to enjoy the cruise. So I'm probably a little bit not that typical. So, you know, if anything, I feel I don't have enough time to do stuff because obviously I want to go around. I want to film things. I want to experience things. So I'm always thinking, even if I'm not a really, I'm not particularly a big trivia fan, for example, or as a talk that I'm not really interested in, I will go to those anyway because I want to see how it goes on. You know, there was a golf putting competition, which I would go to on this trip because I want to go and just experience it, see what people are doing, how people are going to it. So I probably, I'm not atypical, um, but then I video stuff and then there's all the thing I'm writing notes. Is, you know, I have copious notes taken both here and digitally. Uh, then every night you've got to sort out the videos, you know, there's five, 600 clips, something I guess, you know, Heather, because you do this as well. Videoing. So I, I've never got bored on a cruise as such. I'm trying to think if there's anywhere that I've got bored. Um, uh, I would end up, I'm terrible because my, if I ever get bored, I work, I don't relax. I'm, I'm probably a little bit bad from that perspective. Uh, I would uh, I would go and do work. Does it affect your cruise line? So that's a really important point because, um, you know, I, I, I think it would affect it if, I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is I like the fact of having entertainment that's going to appeal to me. It's more an evening thing, I guess. So, you know, I looked, I did miss, I didn't really enjoy the shows so much on region. I, I would pop in and see them and leave a little bit because I felt I needed to, 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 to see them. But like, I like it when I, when there's more stuff like that that I can do. So it would affect it, particularly on itinerary. So for example, the next one I'm doing, Heather, which is two weeks, uh, you know, from uh, Chile round to uh, Buenos Aires, and you know, there's quite a few sea days there. I would want to do it online, like Holland America, where I know they would have a daily program, which is what you know, which would have enrichment talks, more activities, more entertainment kind of stuff. So it does affect that, particularly the attorney. If I was going on a very port intensive, um, I would be less less concerned about that. So, for example, you know, I'm less like I chose the region, next region trip around Japan because there's a phenomenal attorney. It's very port intensive. In fact, I almost wish there's couple of sea days in there and one or two places that I've been to before, I consciously decided not to do an uh, excursion just to get, you know, get a bit of pace into it. Um, Chris, um, hope you're well. Yes, I'm starting my AMA Rome cruise in Barcelona. Anything I should see that might not be on the standard tours? In Barcelona, no, I think pretty much everything is on the standard tours. Uh, and hop on off bus is a great way of getting around those bits and places. If you do want to go to say the uh, Familia Sagrada, for example, nowadays it's worth booking that, uh, is the only one I'd say, because that does get crazy busy. And if you do want to go inside, uh, I would book that um, in advance. Um, so uh, let's have a look. I, I just want to put a point about, maybe I may explain it badly, but one of the things that's interesting is I found, my I actually have the opposite problem, is people, crew want me to take the pictures but you're right i will often ask um is it okay if i take a, take a take a picture or take a video but often you know that people get very excited about it but you're right you have to be very cautious about how you do that i did touch on that um in one of the little live blogs i did it was more about one of the scams i've seen blowing up a little bit in the caribbean where uh, if you're taking pictures in certain places people are particularly stall holders or people on the beach selling stuff are becoming a little bit wise to it. And if you don't ask them to take a picture, even if you stand across the road, take a picture of the stall, they're then like, you've taken my picture, you didn't ask me, you have to buy something. And I saw a little bit of that happening. Um, I don't think so, Tim. I don't think, I don't think I've seen any visiting Felix though. Um, no, I guess I'm thinking Dove, Dover, you could probably use the closest, probably you can get, um, but no, if anyone knows better, 
So uh, I hope you answered the question. I guess you posted that again about the, the COVID thing. Oh, okay. <clears throat> this is a good one. I get asked this again quite often. How much cash do you recommend taking? I've heard that some islands have vendors that take take on the cash. So Kevin, it's, it's um, I mean, when I go, uh, first of all, what are you going to use cash for? Absolutely. Because, as you know, you're going to use your card. So cash you're going to use, uh, it, it, particularly in, in most of the ports, certainly in the Caribbean, but all in many places around the world, even when I've been in places, parts of Asia, some of, uh, some vendors will take US dollars if it's in a real, you know, particularly uh, tourist place um, because, it, you know, it's a, it's a well-known currency. It's easy to exchange. Some countries even use, you know, US dollars more. Um, you're going to use it um, there. You're going to use it for gratuities. And I also like to use it in the casino. I like to take, I don't like to draw money out. I like to take it. So I would normally take a couple of hundred dollars, not that many, um, which mostly end up going, to be honest, in the casino. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, um, you know, but I would always have, you know, and try and take smaller bills. So I'll try and take ones, five, twenties, tens uh, US dollars. Also, because if you're doing gratuities and stuff. Um, so I would normally take three or four hundred dollars. Uh, if, if you know, I have a little thing where I have a, a float, which has probably got 700 US dollars in. But that is just because it's stuff that I've got there. But I would not spend as much as that. Um but US dollars, small bills, absolutely. You know, not not that much cash. You don't, definitely don't need to take a lot of, a lot of cash. Um, Amit asking this question. This has become a really hot topic. Um, what do you think about celebrity now asking you to pay for room service? How can a premium line charge for room service? So we, this is also a good link, Amit. Thank you very much. Setting up um, this week's video, which is coming uh, a little bit later. Maybe I'll do a little punt for it now which is uh, six unwelcome changes cruise lines are making this year. So that's a video that's coming out uh, at the end of this one here, um, which touches on some of these areas. Um, you know, a lot of cruise lines have chosen, obviously, uh, had charges for room service, some, you know, depending on the greater cabin. Um, and I think we're going to see, we, you know, I think we're going to see more and more of these little ch charges kind of cr cropping up. I think it's, you're right, I think it's a little bit unusual when you're sort of, Positions with celebrity, which are trying to position themselves more and more as a luxury line. And if you go to the website, they call themselves luxury. So it is a little bit um, dis like dissonance there. Um, but I think we're just going to, the reality is we're going to see more and more of that. Um, overall, though, I still think, you know, cruising is very good value, which is what is included. But cruise lines are definitely going to be upcharging here and there. And I talk about it a little bit more in the video, but it does, it says a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, yeah, I understand. You, I absolutely understand your point. Um, so, Lucy talking about, are they going to be at that show there? Um, let's have a look. Um, Heather asking the question. Let me touch on this one, actually. Heather asking the question about the muster. So, um, we one of the disappointing things on my Regent trip, and I did talk about that, in, both in the live blog and I talked about in the video that I made about the trip specifically, is we had a live mustard drill. And what I discovered afterwards talking to the hotel director, because I went and asked him, um, is why, like, what's, why has it gone back? Norwegian Cruise Line have decided across all of their brands to go back to live mustard. Royal Caribbean have said that then they're, they're not planning to, the Royal Caribbean at this stage. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, and we're seeing different parks like Disney have gone back. And Heather, I can't remember on your most recent Disney, if you had a live, a, a full muster. Now, what it seems to be is I asked the director why, and he didn't really know why. And one thing I would say it was pretty shambolic because they're not used to running muster drills. And it was very shambolic and took ages and ages. So it kind of exacerbated the annoyance of the traditional muster. Um, talking to some people, uh, what they're saying is because cruise lines were getting very frustrated by how many people didn't, Go and report so they were having constantly to harass people to come and you know check into their muster drill um some cruise line had introduced the watch the video but there was no guarantee that people would watch the video you know but what the, as the hotel director pointed out you couldn't watch anything on your television or do anything on your television until you've watched the muster drill video so people would watch it at some point but i think it was more just the um the hassle factor um so it doesn't seem to come from the coast guard it it just seems to be that i think they were just getting frustrated interesting enough that's the director felt it actually was a fairly efficient system. You know, as you boarded, make them go via the, the must drill. It did seem to me, I guess, which is the points guy's point is, it did seem a little bit less work in some ways because they didn't have to have people standing for hours and hours and hours in the muster station because they just get over within that 
45 minutes or so. So I think it's just, I think it's compliance. I think, unfortunately, we've let ourselves down. Passengers, you know, those who haven't done it, um, uh, have just brought it back. So we'll interest, be interested to watch what Royal Caribbean does, because Royal Caribbean have also got a couple of um, path, patents around uh, virtual mustard drills. So there's lots of speculation they're going to come up with something even beyond that. But it does seem fairly simple. You know, you're either just going to give activate people's key cards until they've checked in, or you fetch your key card from the mustard drill uh, rather than at your cabin. It, it seems there's, there's ways of doing it, which would be, uh, it, it really, I think, put a damn on. It was so nice going on board, doing that. Your vacation kind of started that whole minute that you got on. Michael, which cruise line do you recommend most for a NAR cruise? Well, the one I've chosen is Amma Waterways, um, partly because I really like Amma Waterways. I think they do a great experience um, it, ar around the world. But there's a couple. So I chose Amma. I like the itinerary. I like the price versus the others. You know, it's not cheap, but it was uh, a great itinerary. Uh, New Ship um, as well, which is very nice. Um, Uniworld, which um, Helen and Richard with visit with, with us went, uh, which is a very blingy ship. You know, obviously Uniworld's uh, a very strong uh, line. They had a really great time. But those, those and Viking, of course, if you like the Viking experience. So I focused on those three. I looked at all those three. I felt Amor Waterways had the best uh, accommodation of, I, I really like the way that they run river cruises uh, in a very good way, you know, the service, food. Uh, I like the look of the ship. And the itinerary is really good. Also giving the opportunity to build in the Abu Simbel um, uh, excursion, which I've always wanted to do since I was a kid. So that's that's the one that I chose. And obviously, I, after I've been in April, I'll tell you that was a good good choice or or, or, or not. Um, <clears throat> David, just booked our first cruise. Very exciting. I think you've said always use the cruise line excursions for our first one. But everyone is saying that they're so expensive. You should look around what's best. David, the reason that I say focus on the cruise line for your first one is simply because for many people on their first cruise, find the whole idea of missing the ship quite stressful. And the plus side, if you go on a cruise line excursion, is they will, the ship will wait for you if you're late back, uh, if the excursion gets delayed. If you go on a private excursion or you self-explore and don't come back in time, the ship will leave without you. Uh, and that is true no matter which cruise line. line. So in Region 7 Seas, which is, fills itself as the world's most luxurious cruise line and all that sort of stuff, uh, in St. Martin, we were going to leave without two passengers because they were not back at the all, uh, ball time of 2.30. At five minutes to three, we, we were leaving at three. The captain announced we would be leaving because two passengers were not back. They had taken in everything. They had packed up everything. They were literally about to pull a gangway. And the, the two people arrived back sauntering through. They, they actually they didn't have to peer run, run down the pier to get it, but they would have been left behind. And for a lot of first timers, it is quite a stressful thing, you know, particularly if you're changing time zones and now you've got the right time. So actually you don't enjoy yourself in port. So that's the reason that I, I think going on your first cruise, there's so many new things to ex experiment, explore uh, and learn. Having that as one less thing to worry about is, uh, is a good idea. Of course, you know, they are, there's a premium for, for that. Um, the advantage, of course, is they normally, most cruise lines, they'll also have someone from the cruise line as part of the excursion on many of the excursions. So you've also got someone there if there's an issue um, or you've got any issues with the excursion. So I just I just think in terms of from a stress relieving point of view, do that on your first cruise is is why. Um, they are more expensive. You can look around. There are things like Venture Ashore. I mentioned earlier, shorttripsgroup.com. You know, they run those. They build in little guarantees around getting you back to the ship uh, on time or little guarantees that if they don't, they will help you get to the next port. But that's why I would do it for your first cruise you know, be less stressful than just that. Oh, Costa Toscana, okay. Uh, so Costa Toscana, I thought it might be Costa. Um, so it's, yeah, they, it's, Costa, Costa is an interesting line. I mean, Emma, um, Emma Cruz has just been on, on, on Costa and you're right, it is a little bit more manic. The whole Italian thing is a bit more manic. So I don't, I don't know any, any more, but um, buffets are generally just crazy. Is it like when you go off in the port? Is it a full program on the ship, even in port? Okay, so Peter, I guess you're asking me comparing to is Region 7C uh, where you need to go to the port. So th it's a pretty light program in port. It's a pretty light program even on sea days. So in fact, I have, let me give me, sorry, I just disappeared out of shot for a minute, but I will just give you an example of a port day. Um, 
I don't know if this is going to show up particularly well. But let me give you, so this is a C day daily program. Okay. So as you can probably see, you know, it's, it's fairly light, you know, fairly light in terms of activities. So that's a, that, and that's a C day um, one on port days, you would find uh, even fewer activities. So let's take a look at a, let's take a look here at some bars, just at random. So that is, that is the daily program. It, you know, see very, basically the sports facilities are open. So, so it is, you know, it is a pretty light um, program um, of, of activities. Uh, and, and also the reason for that, I think, is because they have so many excursions included. So, you know, for example, in St. In St. Martin, we had a choice of 17 included excursions to go from. The smallest of all of them was in Bar uh, Barbados, where I think we had seven different excursions to choose from. So most people are going to use that you go from the excursion, which is why I guess they also have have a have a light uh, light thing. Chad and Matthew, on the smaller ultra luxury lines, can it ever feel like the ship is too small, not enough to do? So that obviously that links a little bit to the first point there. But Chad and Matthew, I I really like the smaller ships anyway. But um, and there is a the, I don't personally don't feel there's not enough to do because you're normally going to have a, enough choice of venues. But if you are definitely somebody who likes to have a lot of entertainment laid on, I think that is true. If you want lots and lots of choice, that is probably true. But, you know, if I give you an example of the ship I was on, it's the smallest ship of all. It takes 482 passengers, if I remember correctly. But if you look at dining, so, for example, for dining, you would have the Compass Rose, which is the main dining room, uh, which is having breakfast, lunch and dinner. You then had La Veranda, which was buffet, breakfast, lunch and turned into the Italian at night. So at night, you, you, you got choice there. Out on the pool deck, you then had like a casual dining uh, option. Um, and then you also had like the coffee corner, which would have little snacks. So you then have a, you do have a coffee shop. But then in terms of in the evening, you'd have like the Navigator bar, which is a little bar with a pianist. You'd have <clears throat> the um, Star Bar, which is just in front of the theater. Or you'd have Galileo, Galileo's Lounge up at the top of the ship which had live music playing. So you see, you've got a bit of choice. They had a casino, which was actually quite big, considering the size of the ship. So there's, there is choice of stuff to do. You've got a pool deck, hot tubs, uh, you know, crazy golf course. So there isn't, it's not that there's not enough, the, the, it's not that it's too small, you have choice. But if you want, you know, if you, but if you're the sort of person that wants, um, in the evening, you know, you want to have, be able to choose between going to watch a band and a production show, and something else, and a comedian, and whatever. Definitely, then you, it, it is small. But I don't. I, I quite like that small experience. I like also the fact that you come out of your, your cabin, and it's literally minutes to get anywhere. And, you know, it's boom, boom, boom. Everything's close. So I, I don't. Uh, I, I don't. I haven't asking the <clears throat> billion dollar question. Regional Silver Sea. Which one is better, and what's the difference between the two? I mean, this is a massive question, and I will tackle. I, I, I I'm going to do a whole video around because I really want to spend a bit of time digesting it and do a comparison regions uh, seaborne and silver sea and look at all of those because i think they're different in very different ways interesting though silver sea feel since royal caribbean have taken them over uh, completely to be shifting more towards a region seven sea so for example i booked um a silver sea trip uh into south africa uh in a year or so's time and they have it's a much similar experience where you the flight the transfers, the pre-stay hotel, the choice of included excursions, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is more bundled in. So it's becoming more of a, a similar bundle to, to, to Regent, where Seaborne does it very differently. So I, I, I will answer that in more detail when that once I reflect it better, better on it. Um, so let's have a look. Um, with Master Drone, I think we've been asked Okay, <clears throat> here's, an, here's an easy one to answer. Brendan, how many cruises do you estimate you do go on per year? Well, very easy to answer that. I do roughly one a month. And actually, I list all of those on my blog. So uh, that's why I sort of know. So, um, and I top them all up and all that malarkey. Um, so this year, this year, ironically, I'm probably doing slightly fewer this year because I have a big gap now between this one and the next one. So I think I might be doing 10 this year. Um, but roughly about 
roughly about one a month in the last couple of years. Obviously, when I was working full time, then I was doing maybe two or three or so. Um, uh, so let's have a look. Cindy, I took my first cruise, Princess, <clears throat> to Alaska club class. Only saw our steward twice. On the first day and last room was always made up, but I always had to ask late enough for my next morning breakfast menu. No, that's just pretty unusual, actually, uh, Cindy. So that's, that's that's kind of disappointing. I mean, it's interesting because um, Princess haven't done it yet, but some of the cruise lines have started to reduce the amount of cabin uh, attendant service. So Norwegian most recent announcement where they are um, removing, except for suites, I think they're removing uh, the turned on service in the evening and they're reducing the number of cabin steward roles and merging them. So you have like a senior cabin steward and a junior cabin steward. They're merging them into one, just having one role, slightly fewer, a little bit less kind of service stuff. And we've seen that already one day service on things like uh, um, Pinot Cruises and a few others have done it. So it, that is kind of unusual because normally they're kind of outside in the in the corridor. So, so that's certainly not my experience. I think um, on my last Princess Cruise, I probably didn't see my camp student as often as on others and I only met them on the second day or so, which was a little bit unusual. Um, so, but it is more unusual. And certainly normally, um, Princess, I don't think have stopped the night turned on service, but Obviously, one of the consequences of cruise lines reducing the turndown service at night is things like morning breakfast menus and stuff. Uh, you having to sort of hunt those around in, in the room. Um, and that's something, again, it's a good link into the video that I'm doing later. I'm punching my video a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> anyone else who's had recent experience of Prince? I think a couple of people here have been on Princess recently, uh, if you've seen that more, more recently. Um, so Heather's going on, uh, on Home America, which is fantastic. Um, which which is great. It'd be interesting to know. Uh, Warren asked me the question: Who's the cruise director? It was Margaret. Um, I didn't write her name earlier. Margaret uh, was the was the cruise director. Oh, you've you've seen that. I've answered that. Um, it was interesting because she was just back on the ship. She then just come back on the ship, and there was her sort of assistant. I think she was, they were trying to obviously who was the in the production class. I guess they're building her up. To become cruise director, and the assistant cruise director. So the assistant cruise director sort of started to become the face of quite a few events. I noticed. So I guess they're trying to get her ready to take over a a, a role. I guess with one new ship coming on board. I guess they need more more uh, cruise directors. Uh, Janet, is the next member cruise September October? Yes. So I have a short list of itineraries. Um, some on Hong America, some on Celebrity, which I just want to whittle down. I need to have a discussion with Celebrity, which hopefully will happen next week or the week after. Um, and then I will hopefully be in position to announce that September, October time is definitely when uh, when I want to do it. Oh, here we go. Do you want to draw it live? Yes. Always happy to do that. Um, so let's have, uh, have you gone from Paris to Le Havre? We've been there once and did it. Normally decided wondering if it was worth the time. We reported. I have not done that, um, Moon Man 547, because it just, partly because I know Paris quite well. I worked in Paris for like four and a half years. Um, so I kind of know Paris quite well. So, and didn't particularly enjoy working in Paris, to be honest. But um, uh, so I didn't really feel the need to go to Paris. I felt like I'd done what I wanted to do in Paris. So I haven't done it. It's a very long day. If, the, if you haven't seen Paris and you want to see Paris, it's definitely worth it. It's a bit like, you know, going to Florence um, from from Laverna or where to a port you happen to be in, uh, La Spezia, I guess, the other one. Um, if you've never been to Florence, it's definitely worth a long day to go and see the stuff. Um, I, I would say it is, it's a long, it's a long trip, but if you've never been, it's definitely, definitely worth going. Um, here we go. So, so Jeffrey's saying reprice April Cruise through the solar supplement. <clears throat> so, which is, which is, which is good to, to see. Um, so I will, uh, okay, well, I hope you heard the answer to that. I will definitely do that in much more, I will definitely do that in much more detail. Um, I'll close with Lawrence. If you were to choose one or two excursions in a seven day last cruise by how, which would it be? Okay, so Lawrence, I, uh, it also depends a little bit on your budget because excursions uh, in Alaska can be really, really costly. So um, let's, so um, what I would suggest Again, I'll do a little pun for the videos. If you watch my Alaska videos, I do dive into a little bit around uh, excursions and what I would recommend you doing in the mix of those um, overall and some of the, the, the cost perspective. But if, if let's assume budget's not a big issue, 
um, what would I choose? Certainly, I would definitely try and do one of those trips, which Juno you know is a really good place to do it, where you get up onto a glacier by helicopter and do one of two things. Either you walk on the glacier, which I did on my last trip, or the trip before, where you actually go um, dog sledding. Um, because during the summer months, uh, the dogs that they use in winter and use for racing and stuff like that, um, they, they often take them up onto the glacier because of the because it's cold, it's not too hot, and they train the dogs and the, the, up there, and the dogs, you can go dog sledding, which is an amazing experience. Now, those are very, very, very expensive excursions. You're talking like $600 or so for those excursions, but they are incredible. So if your budget can uh, stretch that far or you can save up, it, it is worth it. So that's one thing I would do is get up on the glacier. Obviously, if you can't get up on a glacier, it's too expensive. There's other ways of doing it um, where you can actually go, um, someone can do little hikes along the glacier or the front of the glacier or whatever. The second thing that I would do, and that's partly because I'm a slightly geeky about it, but I would do uh, when you're in Skagway, I would do the um, the White Pass uh, train, the, the Yukon and White Pass train. Um, and there's various permutations of those. Um, depending on what ship you're on, like on Holland America, often, although the, assuming they really reopened the pier that was damaged, um, you know, the, the, the rock fall, but let's just assume that by the seasons, they'll fix that. But the train often stops right there, or you'll get taken to the train. It's another train which, which starts right, often by the ship. It's right by the ship, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and you can do one trip which goes all the way up the mountain, gets to the top of the mountain, and comes back down. But it's been a great experience. They used to, again, if you have a limited budget, they didn't have it when I went last time, because I think they'd taken it out, again, with all some of the COVID restrictions and stuff. But if but if again, if you have a big, so do it, you can do it in, in the standard fare, but they also have like a premium one, which is a small carriage where you have a personal narrator and they have snacks and stuff. And that's really fantastic. Um, again, that's probably about seven times more than the regular one, which is about $40, a regular one. The other one's like a hundred and something dollars. But it's really great if, if again, if you're budget, but to go up the train. But, it, um, but if you don't want to do the there and back, they then have various permutations. So Hopefully, again, for this season coming, you can go across into Canada, which you couldn't really do when I was there last time, because, again, with all the different differing restrictions on tests and all that, blah de blah But assuming that's all been lifted, um, you've got somewhere you can actually go right into the Canadian side, or you can get off at the top and you can do like a bike ride down um, and so on. So those those are the two that I really, really recommend. Well, a lot of people, of course, are going to recommend is things like whale watching, um, for example. But those are the are my two top excursions um, uh, th that I would do. Uh, Heather's made a video about excursion with the, cruising with the babies. So that's very handy. Um, Stephen, we are an older gay couple who book celebrity. They're very gay friendly, but do you feel they're going towards a younger demographic? Absolutely. Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, um, they are. Um, I actually made a video recently, Stephen, about this where I, a couple of weeks ago, um, where I look at them in more detail uh discussing this very issue i mean with the edge beyond uh, and the ascent they are definitely targeting younger they are definitely targeting more families as well so it's going to become interesting because i think we're going to see particularly on the the solstice class ships if you look at and the millennium class ships particularly with some of the itineraries that they're doing um they are definitely appealing to the more traditional uh, celebrity um, uh, cruiser, but they are definitely pushing the younger. I mean, you just have to look. It's very interesting. If you watch the excursion, simple things, little clues. If you watch the excursion videos that they show now on celebrity on, on the television or, or the, the presentations, uh, if you look at the advertising they do, you will find that they show kind of 30-somethings, 20-somethings, lots of families in them. Um, and it's, you know, it's very, very interesting. Obviously, they do lots of stuff social media around inclusive inclusivity um and uh, diversity and that sort of stuff so they definitely are going uh younger they're trying to go up market and, and younger at the same time and i think we will see that split a little bit now clearly if you go on an edge class ship out of school holidays i think we're still going to see it we will still see the more traditional cruiser, but they absolutely are going for a, a, a younger crowd and that they make they almost make no bones about that uh, at all um, Michelle making the point, thank you, the point about um, the, the Norwegian Royal Caribbean. I remember checking the Royal Caribbean, so that's very, very helpful. Um, 
Michael, I, let's just talk a little bit about the link. So there's lots of, the, 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 this, there's been a whole um, thing around, a lot of people are asking about Norwegian cruise lines. Norwegian is having no more money issues from what I can see both financially and all the reports than Carnival or Caribbean Group. They're all facing the same amount of debt and so on. So I think what Norwegian are doing uh, much more vocally and visibly um, in terms of cost cutting. So they definitely are, you know, they have cut head office by I think it was 10%. They've announced, you know, they're increasing gratuities. They've announced cuts in, in dining back and entertainment and so on. So they definitely are, um, you know, making much more visible some of the, um, the, the, the tackling of costs. And they have just recently, I think the thing that caused some confusion is they've just recently refinanced some of their bonds, which I think a lot of people have picked up on as an issue. Now, Carnival have done that and Royal Caribbean have all refinanced bonds. Um, I think all the cruise lines are, you know, they're under, they are now that basically the ships are full out again. I mean, they're all talking about 90, uh, uh, between 90 and 100 and plus percent capacity heading into summer. They're all talking about increasing fares. They're talking about increasing spend. They are definitely now that passengers are going back, starting to squeeze much more to kind of reset their finances. Um, so I, I'm pretty I beat on Norwegian overall. Um, you know, I have Oceanic cruises, I have Norwegian cruises, and Norwegian cruises booked. Um, so so I, I, I feel relatively confident, touch wood, I think so. Um, ah, Barb. <clears throat> so I, I did refer a little bit to some of Barb's experience, so I hope you don't mind, Barb. So after a recent disaster, cannot COVID cruise, should we get back on the horse into the exact crane cruise next year and hope for the best, even though it's 50% more expensive? So that was on Queen Victoria. Really interesting point, Barbara. I guess it depends how, um, whether Queen Victoria now is like a ship which brings back uh, shudders, as it were. I mean, I do think, you know, the, I, 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 would be, I would be tempted to try, I mean, you're right, first of all, the prices are crazy more expensive. I would be tempted to try one of their different ships. I feel like that ship and that it's always going to have that. I don't know if you feel that, but I, I suspect I would feel that ship's always a little bit uh, kind of tainted, tainted in, in, in many ways. Um, but I think, you know, Cunard hopefully will get their act together. They do seem to be very erratic with customer service. I get lots of emails about Cunard, um, customer service and lack of consistency. Up. But I, hopefully they will get a grip on it. Um, uh, but I would maybe look at one of the one of their other ships and maybe the, you know, the Queen, the Queen Anne or somewhere like that. Um, I worry that you'd go back and you'd always get that sort of like, ooh. Um, Emma, would you do a Norwegian cruise line for Alaska? I think they offer no place of air. So I would consider Norwegian. I, 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 they, you're right. They, Norwegian Princess and Holland America are the ones that have most access to Glace, Glacier Bay. Mark, my partner, had actually booked Norwegian Encore uh, for this year to Alaska, which he's actually had to cancel because in our work clash has come up. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I, I would, in terms of if you want the Norwegian experience, which is, you know, the bigger shows and the choice and all that stuff. So if that appeals to you is going to Alaska with that hot experience. Um, so I would consider Norwegian if you're looking for that. Personally, I prefer the slightly more enrichment, smaller ship experience in, in Alaska. Um, but you're right, they do have uh, a lot of experience in Alaska. And if that free, you know, the anytime, di the, sorry, the um, freestyle, freestyle cruising, freestyle cruising, the bigger production shows, all the choice, or, or their rear premium, of course, they have, and I would absolutely consider they definitely are, uh, you know, they know, they know Alaska really, really well. Ah, okay, KY, <clears throat> does navigator show her age? Is it worth traveling with, with the older ships versus grandiose better? Navigator, absolutely. I mean, she does show her age in that you know she's an old ship, mostly more in the way that she sails, in that it is a, it's a ship which has much more vibration, for example. So if you're at the back of the ship, like at La Veranda, uh, you know, in the evening at Seti Maria or whatever, there's a lot of vibration there. So I certainly wouldn't want a cabin at the back. Although I did meet some people on the cruise that had uh, cabins towards the back and they didn't have any real issue with it. But it is a slightly more noisy ship. So the way it sails is just more noisy. I guess it's not as streamlined. It's, you know, it's an older ship. It started its life, by the way, as a Russian uh, spy ship, uh, which I discovered. And I'll talk about more about that in the, in the videos I'm making and stuff. But, um, you know, so the hull started a very different life. So it, inside, I mean, it, it is a more dated 
layout, I guess, or traditional, whatever layout. It's a slightly more quirky layout. It doesn't feel dated inside in that, you know, it's still very beautifully maintained. And there's people constantly cleaning, painting all over the place. Um, but, you know, just it does feel a bit old. You know, when I look at some of the, 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 the videos for the newer ships uh, or you know, there's a TV series just started in the UK, which I think is on Splendor, you know, it's definitely a much more, uh, more contemporary uh, glitzy thing. So I'm really looking forward. I'm going on Explorer, which I know is not one of their newer ships. I would probably, mm, mm, when I go back, I would probably choose one of the other ships, not because I didn't like Navigator. I love Navigator, but I feel in terms of bang for buck, the, 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 the more modern-y ship. Um, so I wouldn't say no to Navigator if that tenor is right, but I would probably choose the other ones. Uh, and if I had a choice, I would, uh, I would choose the newer ones, I think. Um, is anyone else having problems with the Royal Caribbean app on the larger ships? Um, I haven't. I did see somebody posting a journey about having someone. I saw someone posting on the, in the Facebook groups having lots of issues with that. So if anyone's got any knowledge with that, um, then shout. <laughs> KY, we have never been on a Caribbean cruise. Which ports would you wouldn't you want to miss? So. <clears throat> That's always difficult because, of course, it depends a lot whether you're going east, west, or southern. So maybe I'll talk about the ports that I really enjoy in the Caribbean. And I do, I'm trying to remember my Caribbean video if I talk about this, but maybe I will, I'm going to do a, a, a Caribbean video. So maybe I will actually uh, base a little bit on this because I went to some ports I haven't been to before. So maybe I'll build that into the the must, like the, the best, not whatever. But I really like, um, I really like uh, Dominica. Uh, although the town is a little bit grubby and the people are actually probably the most aggressive of all the Caribbeans, but some of the things you can do in Dominica is very, uh, very nice, very interesting, um, both on land and off land. I also really like St. Martin, which is probably a much more modern contemporary place. I really like Grenada. I find that the beaches there are particularly good. Uh, St. Bart is very interesting for the first time, partly because you just see like all the blingy where the money goes. Uh, St. Kitts I really like. Um, I'm trying to think it's probably the easy way to answer the question is, um, the the ones the ones that I would let me tell you the ones that I would that I don't enjoy because that's probably quicker is it's almost the, the Costa Maya for example which is just a fake kind of place created I don't really uh, enjoy very much that's probably the only and Barbados I'm less wild about um, maybe because I've been to Barbados a few times but I always feel about Barbados is kind of very overdeveloped big kind of busy thing it's not it's, it's not good so those those are probably the those are the only ones that I would avoid, really. Everything else I, I really enjoy. So I don't know that I've really been very helpful, but I will perhaps spend a little more time thinking about that and put it in my, most, my upcoming um, uh, a video. We've traveled with Regent and looking for a Christmas market on Scenic. <clears throat> Kent, we've traveled with Regent looking at a Christmas market cruise on Scenic. What are your thoughts on the comparison between the two? Well, uh, certainly, Kent, um, Scenic is sort of at, definitely at the upper end of the river cruising side. So things like Scenic, Uni World uh, are sort of right at the top there. Uh, Amber Water is probably sort of not quite in that group. And then you sort of got like your Vikings, Amber Waterways, Avalon. The next. So Scenic is probably a good choice. I mean, Crystal, of course, were trying to be the, the you know, we're trying to do the river thing. Obviously, that didn't work out. They got went bust. They've sold their ships on to another provider, which I don't know um, how good or whether they're doing a crystal type experience. But I think Scenic should be a very, is a very good, uh, good choice if you're looking for something uh, like that. Um, Dale, I've cruise watch alerts for my Holland America cruise played in full. I got an alert that it dropped 10% in price. Do you recommend content? How now wait for bigger multiple decreases? Dale, you should contact them now. Now the challenge of course, because you've paid in full is you have, you do have a slightly less negotiating ability. And I haven't had recent experience myself of Honor America this like six months or so uh, with what they do. So I would contact them now. The reason I would contact them now is you're likely to find actually you start to get alerts with prices going up because prices are absolutely starting to go up. So, for example, I'm starting to get alerts with I've signed up um, on Cruise Line as well. I started using the Cruise Line one as well as Cruise Watch. And more of my alerts are price increases than price decreases at the moment. Uh, and again, this video I've got coming up um, after this talks about that. So I would contact them, make sure that you're doing, of course, like for like, 
uh, cabin. Um, and you, they're unlikely because you paid in full, they're not going to give you money back. So you're either asking for an upgrade or onboard credit. Um, so if you look at that and you know that you, know, you can get a better cabin grade for that, you know, that's what it says is, is, is push those two things. But I wouldn't wait because you might find that disappears. Um, and lines are pushing uh, pushing back um, on, on that. Uh, Geert asking the question there when uh, on regions, region seven seas, I guess you're asking, or Norwegian. So there are not, there weren't any on region seven seas. Uh, uh, there weren't any LGBT uh, events um, there. Uh, Norwegian, yes. Norwegian, uh, certainly when I've been on Norwegian, there have been LGBT um, meetups. In fact, the only lines that I've been on recently where there haven't been some sort of meetup was on Regent and when I was in Galapagos because there was only 100 people on. So I guess they figured out if there was any LGBT people, they could figure it out for themselves. Um, but I'm trying to think if there's any other, any other line I've been on, uh, every other line has. And particularly you'll find, you know, the bigger ship, you know, so the, so the premium ship category, so your princess celebrities um, are in America and then your, your Royal Caribbeans, Norwegians, MSCs, you know, those bigger ships pretty much all have them. Um, so uh, the short answer to the question is no. Um, can you share a plus package between you now? What's, what you'll normally find, um, and I need to triple check the double check, should I say, the princess, but uh, I think I'm right in saying that there's only one line, and I can't remember which one it is, but if you buy a package, one of these packages, everybody in the cabin has to buy the package. So you can't share it. And that they're specifically designed not to share. So you'll find if you're in the same cabin, no, you won't be able to, you'll actually both have to buy it. Now there is one line, and I can't remember offhand which one it is that doesn't require that. Is it Royal Caribbean? I can't remember, there's one line, but I'm pretty sure that in Princess, everybody has to buy it. Every, and if, if it's the alcohol package, everyone over 18, um, in most regions has to buy it. So if you, you know, if there's four of you in the cabin, but two of your kids or teenagers, just check also whether it's an 18 or 21, because it's on as everybody has to, uh, has to buy the package. Um, here we go. Calling all ports. Hi there, Andrew and Diane. Okay. Um, I need to check out your stuff. I don't, don't know that I've come across to you. Have I? You seem to be having fun with the new Insta360 action cam. How do you think it'll change your channel content in the future? Would you recommend one to other travel vloggers? So for those who don't know uh, and didn't follow me on social media, but this, have I got a handy? No, I haven't. But I, this, uh, I've seen for a long time these Insta360 cameras where you basically video all around you and you can do three, like, um, inst like these modes where you can um, uh, shoot yourself and you can, it looks a little bit like a drone thing. Uh, I got it because one of the things that's, because I, I cruise quite a lot by myself, you know, I often am having to hold my camera out. And I had these very close shots. The Insta360 enables me to effectively look like someone else is shooting me. So the way it'll change my content is it just will give me a little bit more ability to show me uh, you know, in situ and create more drone effects without a drone. Because obviously you can't bring a drone on board most ships. I've given up bringing a drone. So you can create some drone-like effects. So that's how it's going to, going to change. Um, so keep a look out. I'm going to shoot my little video on 360 because and um, what I'm doing with that. So um, uh, good to know that Sarah B is doing a good job with the members cruise. Right. We've run out of time. I realize we're charging on and I'm going on. So thank you so much, everybody. Just remind you that next week I will have some guests, Paul and Carol on. When this video uh, ends, it'll actually link to that. So you can click a reminder for that. I have a video coming up imminently, which will be going live any second now which is uh, around uh, unwelcome changes, which you've been touching on. Thanks so much for joining me. So I will see you hopefully next week. Have a great week. Take care.